Welcome to Barbell Logic Rewind. It's the Barbell Logic Podcast. As you all know, tell a friend, please send a link to this podcast to the guy that you know that's just not thriving in the gym and uh, help us spread the word. And it's a big help to us. We don't charge you a thing for this. All we want you to do is uh, help us spread the word. That's all we ask. That ain't much. So send this to a friend or your mom that needs to lift and get back in the gym. And, uh, you know, we say some stuff in here, but your mom's heard it. So go ahead and send it to her anyway. We're going to talk about accessories today, yo. Um, Yes, we are. We've talked about accessories a little bit. We've talked about some supplementals quite a bit. Yep. We've recently put out some YouTube videos about the chin, the barbell row, which we call the actual fifth and sixth lifts. Yep. And we're going to give them a thorough treatment here in our long form show. In fact, we are. I even made notes. I don't don't need no stinking notes. I know, but I was trying to make sure I didn't want to forget anything. So let's talk about the difference between supplemental and accessories as I have described them. Because it's the wrong paradigm. That's not a new paradigm. (laughs) Don't screw this up for me. I don't think that yours is necessarily wrong for sure, but a supplemental lift to me is a variant on the main lift. I agree 100%. Okay, so we're talking about a supplemental squat lift would be a tempo squat, box squat, high bar squat, safety bar squat, any other squat, right? Let's just go down the list because people want to hear that. Supplemental presses would be pin presses, press starts. Yep. Pretty much it. Seated presses, totally strict presses. I've been using those way more often. The more people get better at press press 2.0 in the Olympic press, the more they need a strict press to drive the actual strength piece of this. And so like that for press, for bench press, we've got close grip bench press, wide grip bench press, axle press, floor press, board press, chains, chain presses, band presses, chains or bands for any of those, pause, two second pause, three second pause, any of those sorts of things. Holds. Yeah, although I haven't used those, but it's probably hearing about your Jennifer Thompson thing. And since that lady benches like nine times her body weight, maybe I should start doing that. The deadlift would be deficits and rack pulls, primarily haltings, paused, chains i don't really like bands but isometric <laughs> uh, you know i did those iso- did I ever tell you about doing isometric isotonic deadlifts so the original power rack was actually for isometric or isotonic movement so think about isometric you're pushing in one position it never moves right the length of the muscles don't change correct actually you originally would set the bar up between two two sets of catch pins and those two sets of catch pins would be close together and so the bar would only move an inch or two and you would pick it up off one set of catch pins and you would pull against the other set of catch pins or you push against the catch for whatever, three, four, five seconds. So everybody, when they started doing that, they got really freaking strong and really Breaking freaking world big. Records. Yeah. And everybody's like, man, it's these isometric isotonics. And in fact, at the same year, D-ball was invented <laughs> and given to the York Barbell Club team. And so then when they realized it was the D-ball, they kind of shit on the isometric work. No, and, wait a minute. I don't think that's what happened at all. That is actually what happened. No, I don't think so. No, I've read this. Well, well, what do you think? Here, here's, I read the same article, and the way I read it okay. is that these guys are taking Diana Ball, getting donkey strong. Yeah. And Hoffman sells this product and says, oh, it's the of product. Of course. Yeah, right. Which is different than what you're saying. Well, okay. <laughs> but then they realized later on that it was the D-ball, and then everybody shit on the isometric stuff. So for a while there, I would do these pulls. So I would do a deadlift from the floor and I would pull it to the rack pull height at mid shin where you would pause a pause deadlift. Pull it to the pull it to the pins. I would have the pins set right. It's the bottom of the pins, you know, against the top of the the rack out of the ground. That's exactly right. And you pull, pull, and you see if you could hold it against those pins for like three seconds and set it down. We work up like 600 pounds and pull. Dude, you're talking about brutal. Yep. That's a brutal brutal pull suck yeah so you can do an eccentric contraction which is really not in the concentric yeah so an eccentric the muscle resists lengthening it lengthens under load yep concentric it's getting shorter under the load Correct. so normal contraction you're making a muscle with your bicep making a muscle yep and then <laughs> that's river bottoms like katusa there <laughs> maybe and then isometric you know from the greek to yep. not change length correct so any uh, of those barbell movements are what do we do what did we miss do we do all four lifts yeah i think we yeah, did we did also, I think a clean and a snatch, I would consider supplemental movements probably to the pull to a deadlift. I mean, there are deadlift Arguably. variants on some, yeah. whatever. What do you do with those? So we're talking about the ones that aren't that today. Right. Accessory movements are the ones that aren't the variants on the main lifts. Yeah, they aren't analogs to the main lifts. Now, the, the thing is, I've kind of become the guy that does the lecture on the squat. I've done most of the squat lectures for the past couple of years. And I start out with this talk that says, okay, your mom walks into a gym or like anybody. That, Sounds like a bad gym. It's not us, right? Yeah, right. And there's an infinite number of exercises that they can do. Anybody that walks into it, especially a Globo gym, there's an infinite number of exercises. How do you know what exercises are the things that we do that give us the most bang for our buck? And that's where we start to flesh out those 
three primary criteria. We use exercises that use the most muscle mass with the most weight for the greatest effective range of motion. And when we apply those three criteria, we get the primary lifts, the squat, the deadlift, the bench press, and the press, and then potentially the, the clean and the snatch. But we can also apply that same criteria to accessory movements. And we can start to get, okay, what accessory movements give us the best bang for our buck with regards to... Now, now why do you want to do them, though? Because we're going to do our four big lifts, which meet our three criteria that you sure. just named. But if you listen to our episode about the advanced programming, the guy or gal cannot do enough work in the four main lifts to get an accumulate enough stress. Sure. So we do some supplements to get some more stress. Yep. And then but, we can also we, do the accessories to get some more stress. But we don't do isolation movements for accessories because they no. don't add to the thing that we're trying to do, which is get strong. Yep. So we still use multiple joint movements. They may not be as big a compound. They may not use as much weight. They may not use a barbell. They may use body weights or dumbbells or whatever. But they're better than sitting down on a Nautilus machine and doing a single joint, one arm curl, right? Should we do curls? Yes. Yeah, but what kind of curls? Bar Standing straight bar curls. Yeah, with the barbell. Right, because it works better. So let's go through our favorite accessory movements. And now, first, before we get to what Should they are. Should we Hamburg's definition of the <laughs> accessory? Well, I, I do like the way you organize them. So here's what I think would be a better way to do that. Rather than to throw off the definition of what an accessory movement is, I think the way you're organizing them is very well thought out. So how do you organize these accessory yeah, movements? You're, you're right. I wouldn't define them this way, but this is why I think they're useful. Yeah. The accessories are useful because they work the antagonist. Antagonist, group, correct. To a lift that's important to us. Absolutely. So, so if you think about the bench press, you're laying on your back, you're pushing the weight away, and your back is horizontal. Sure. In the barbell row, your back is horizontal, and you're pulling the weight. So you use the muscles that are opposed to those. Absolutely. And here's how this came to me. When I bench maximally heavy, my biceps are sore AF. Yep. The barbell row works those. And yep. The muscles in the back yep. that we use to pull our shoulder blades back together sure. to hold our back tight while we're doing our bench press. And so the, the bench press, or the barbell row supports the bench press in that way. The chin up or the pull up supports the press in the exact same way. That's so exactly we push right. the weight overhead while we pull the weight down. Now, are you going to go through all these or should we actually talk about them as we go? Because I think it works. Okay. I think you actually set it up nicely that way. So if we, especially for upper body, so I think actually lower body changes and lower body, we'll get to accessories here in a minute for lower body, but primarily most of the accessories that we do are upper body accessories. Yep. And we'll talk about the why here in a minute, but let's stick with this for a second. So let's start with bench press. So since we know what bench press is, the opposite of bench press is a row, yep. right? So it's a row. So it's, it's going to be a barbell row. It's going to be our primary movement. Certainly a dumbbell row would be okay. An yep. inverted ring row would be okay, like a body weight. But the primary one we use is the way we teach the barbell row, which is a row where the barbell starts on the floor every single time. We like them pronated. Pronated certainly uses a little less bicep, but it also uses a little less bicep tears. <laughs> and so I'm going to err on the less bicep tear. If you go really heavy and you strap up and you're trying to really push the weight up, you should probably turn and go back to pronated yep. because you're really going to put too much tension on that bicep tendon. So we love the barbell row because it's a big giant compound movement. It's opposite of the bench press. By the way, I try to drive up my barbell row. I think the goal is to drive your barbell row up to equal with your bench press. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that's hard to do. And most people aren't there. Most people start barbell rowing about 60% of their bench press. But I think we need to push get there. We need to push to get as close as we can to our actual bench press as possible. Michael Monster. You're about there. Oh, don't no, I can row more than I can bench. I can row more three by five than I can bench three yeah, by five. I can't. I mean, I can't do that. But I hear you. You want to keep them as strict as you can. You want to keep your back horizontal and parallel to the ground as much as you in fact can. You do. But the thing is, when you weigh 198 and the barbell's 315, ain't going to happen. Well, so I've been chasing that. And I recently rode 365. You said I had too much back English in it. And I think that's right, but I think I have to do 275. Three, you, didn't, you said no, 365. Oh, no, it was 265. 265. <laughs> I did 265 well, just for the here. But I think I'm going to have to do 275 with a little back English so I can do 265 in strict and horizontal, you know. But the darn thing helps. And it was unclear to me how the thing, you know, it's like how in the hell is the barbell row improving the bench and the press? It wasn't clear to me how it did. Okay. Why? Why wasn't it clear? Yeah, why wasn't it clear? Well, okay, tell me why then. Well, you tell me why it wasn't. Well, you're not pushing the damn bar away from your body. Okay, but what role do lats play in the press and the bench press? Yeah, they just hold your shoulder in isometric. Well, that's kind of important. Well, it is. They're sort of the foundation of support. That's true, but I rarely fail because I lose tightness in my torso. Sure. I just can't get the damn bar up. Okay. So why do you think it works now? Well, because of that antagonist-agonist pair <laughs> yeah, idea. Yeah, right. So, yeah, 
there seems to be a clear need, and I don't know exactly what the percentage is, and I don't think you can define it because of the way anthropometry changes, but to keep things in relative balance, right? Now, obviously, Uh no, stick with me for a second. So just understand what I'm saying. Muscle imbalances. No, I think Uh it's actually important. So do we have to define them as well? Do I have to do exactly the same or do I need to press Uh, exactly 70%? I don't think it's important at all. I actually do. I don't think you can get out of balance. No, you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. Look, there are lots of guys that bench press all day, every day, yep. all day, every day. Right. And they don't and have press. never rode. They've never done back work. Right. And I'm not talking about the guys that just like do bench and curls and never squat. But I'm talking about the guys who bench and curl and never row and the guys that bench and never press. Yep. I think we have serious problems with guys that have massive pecs and massive biceps and no triceps and no way to elbow extend. Right. And no way to humorous to retract their shoulder blades or what is this? It's extension, yeah, right? That's retraction. What retraction, that? protraction. I know, but what about the I always get the humorous screwed up. This is actually flexion and extension. So right. it's a, so it's humorous extension. Mm-hmm. To extend the humorous, they all they can do is put flexion on that. There's a problem there. Right. I don't think there's a problem in our program because we deadlift. I mean the deadlift takes care of that shoulder blade retraction issue. Okay. It, I think it takes care of that. But I think that the accessory with this antagonist agonist idea. Let's just get additional bench press volume without benching. Because when I bench really heavy, my biceps get sore. And so that shows me that my biceps are doing work. And so if I, I believe, and if you read, you know, your anatomy, this idea of an agonist antagonist pair is sure. legit. I mean, everybody agrees that these muscles work in tandem and they just stabilize the elbow, the tricep sure. and the bicep both work in any time. The elbow one is shortening is under load, one is lengthening under load. Right, one's Same eccentric time. and the other's That's eccentric. Exactly right. and eccentric. They always work in pairs. Correct. So I believe that it's a way that we can accumulate volume in those lifts. Okay, that makes sense. And so that's why I think they work. I get it. I see what you're saying. I think because we deadlift, we don't have any of these imbalance problems. Now the gym bros with the giant chest and they can't, you know, extend the uh, humerus. humerus. For them, yes. I think that right. people that do the starting strength okay. linear progression, I don't think they have a muscular imbalance issue that needs to be re- remediated. I think they need additional volume, but they can't push anything else off their chest because they're exhausted and they're okay. an intermediate lifter. That's fair. So we talked about barbell rows. The other one really, which is the sixth exercise. I don't want to know if that's fair. I want to know if it's right. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have a, any reason to refute we'll that right now. and then just meditate on it. Yeah, let's do it. The fifth exercise, meaning the chins. We talk about the chins all the time. We love chins. So that's that's the antagonist for the press, right? Yep. So we know we love chins. We love pull-ups. Well, I actually like any grip. I like underhand. I, I like supinated. Hammer. I love, yep. I, I love, love pronated. Hammer. I love neutral. I love throw a towel over the bar. Mm-hmm. I love I love all that stuff. I think you should just be able to do pull-ups all the, day, the every day. grenade ones. Yeah. yeah. All that stuff's oh, I fine. It. Like, I, I think it's stuff's great. I think you can't do enough of that stuff. So that one with my Hambrickian. Yep. heuristic for thinking about this that that's the opposite of the press so the press a pronated grip push it overhead okay. Okay. the pull up pull the thing down okay so now so now we're going to throw the kink in it mm-hmm. what's the dip i think the dip is actually a supplement okay because if you're using it as the antagonist idea that works but if you use my idea that it's an accessory slot that helps it, you drive decline, up the, it's a decline bench press is what it is yeah it's, it's kind of true uh only it's not really that you know, there's no barbell and it doesn't. Well, except right? when you're down in the hole, people always sort of lean over when they're down there in the hole. And the lean bench. forward. It, yeah, it's a decline bench press. Okay, that's fine. So I, do you like a dip? I like a dip. Yeah. I like it a whole bunch. I particularly like it if it's weighted because it helps pull us upright and makes it a stricter movement. Now, wait a minute. What's wrong with bending forward on the dip? Well, nothing. Nothing necessarily, but I'm trying to get the tricep work. If you want the pec work, you know, you want to be leaned over okay. a little bit more. Okay. So again, if we use the three criteria, the bending over is actually going to allow you to use more muscle mass than staying upright. Well, so I normally will program them if somebody's having lockout trouble. Okay. That's fair. I like you, you throwing know, chains over your neck and, yeah. and weighting them that way. Well, I, do I, that. Would rather, yeah. I know. No, I'd rather weight it with chains <laughs> than weight it with a dip belt, although both are fine. Right well, now, it, again, it depends on what you want. If you want the chest, you put sure, the chain around your neck. Sure, it makes sense. If you want the train that lockout, super, super heavy yeah. kettlebell on your waist, yeah, we'll makes keep you train the right. lockout. Well, often they can get low and get up, and then they can't get that last ten degrees out of that elbow. Correct. And yeah. so I like it to train the lockout. I like training dips the way star train dips, which is one time heavy, really, really brutally heavy per week, and one time for high volume. I think it works Interesting. well. What's, the, the, heaviest, what's the heaviest weighted dip you've done? I know I've done 245. I'm trying to think if I've ever done. At body weight? like Plus body weight. That's right. That's serious. 
I've done 180 yeah, we, for like a single with my body. Weight. Yeah, 245 was a single. I think that's as heavy as I've gone. We used to do that a lot at Strong. We had a really good set of dip bars made. That We had a guy that worked at a machine shop for a while and made us some really heavy duty, nice dip bars and and, it, and a good step up to it. So you could step mm. up on it with a, a big weight with a big dip belt. If you have the Matador attachment for your rogue rack, yeah. put it on the inside. Really? Yeah. I've never done that. I always it's do it on the outside. Stable. You need to put it on the outside and that thing's like rattling yeah. and shaking around. You put that thing on the inside. All right. Solid. So let's stay with triceps. The other one that I love for triceps are both LTEs and rolling dumbbell extensions. So LTEs are line tricep extensions. A better way to do that is with the easy curl bar, which yep. isn't great for curls, but it's great for line tricep extensions. And because the tricep will both control elbow extension and humerus extension as well, then what we want to do is not just bend at the elbow, but actually let it come, for those of you guys who are watching the YouTube video, actually let it come down below the head. So it's a lying tricep extension. So you're laying down. On the bench. And then think of putting your hand behind your head and touching the floor behind yeah. you as you lay on the bench. So, so it's sort of a dumbbell pullover to start the movement, yeah. and then you finish with the elbow extension. And that works really well with an easy bar curl. Also, I think I might actually like it better with dumbbells, where you do the same thing. So you let the elbow go into flexion, and then you let the humerus go into flexion, and then you extend the humerus and extend the elbow. Flexion, flexion, extension, extension. Yep. And then point your thumb at the ceiling. Okay. Get just that little bit more range of motion, okay. a little more that's contraction. Fair. Yeah. So I love those rolling dumbbell extensions. We use those as well a lot. So that's for the triceps, the two main things I'm going to do there are dips and then either LTEs or rolling dumbbell extensions. Most of our clients, of course, you can do the LTEs even with a straight barbell, but I can convince my clients usually to buy an easy bar curl. You can find easy bars for $10 on Craigslist yeah. all the time. That's the they're, most common thing. They're everywhere. Those. Dumbbells, having clients have access to dumbbells are a little bit more difficult, but if they've got it, I'll usually use those. Quality on the uh, easy curl bar doesn't really even matter. You no, don't really, nobody puts any significant weight on them. No, so it doesn't Anything matter. you so, can get. Yeah, so fine. if the sleeve spin doesn't really, <laughs> doesn't really matter. For biceps, I like the straight bar curls, uh, which is a sort of an accessory movement, both to the bench press and to the chin. Yeah. Right? So the bicep is an external rotator of the forearm. Yep. So when you have that straight bar, you get a little more contraction, a little more shortening bit, of, of the bicep. Yeah, oh. it is actually quite a bit. But man, my guys that are fighting the bicep tendonitis, which is so many of us guys that are a little bit older, you yep. know, we, gosh, I'll have them do them with Me the too. easy curl bar. I do too. If we can avoid that little bit of external rotation, they can often keep from angering that biceps tendon. So then not if we also think about the same way we thought about the triceps, since the bicep doesn't just cross the elbow, but it also crosses the shoulder mm -hmm. and also helps create shoulder flexion or humerus flexion, then what we can do is we want to make sure that when we curl, we don't just curl the bar or the things that we're curling up to sort of our mouth or nose level, but more to the forehead so that we get that additional lift on the elbow and, mm. and get full extension there at the top. So we want to make sure, I always tell people if they're curling an easy bar curl or a straight bar barbell that we bring it all the way up to the forehead rather than to the mouth. I don't want to just focus on the elbow. I want to focus nice. on the shoulder as well. That's a new twist for me. You didn't know? Yeah, it's good. I like it. It's and nice. you don't want to go past the point to where like it gets easy. So you want to make sure you keep the forearm vertical at the top. As soon as you pass vertical, it actually gets easy because it's it starts but to close. Gravity's working for you. Yeah, then, then you've got gravity working. And then you hit yourself in the face. <laughs> you don't uh, want that at all. So the curl here is an accessory. Yep. And it's an accessory to the bench press because it's working that antagonist, antagonist pair. Yeah, that's probably true. And yep. I use it as a supplement to the chin. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. It supplements the chin and because it is it, accessory for the bench press. It's essentially the same as the top half yeah, of the fair. range of motion of the chin. So my bigger guys, you know, if you're a guy and you weigh 245, I mean, it's really hard to do a lot of reps at that. Sure. So they can put, you know, 82 on the on the bar and do some curls and get some more volume that'll help them keep moving up on those chins. Sure. So you'll notice as we've talked about these accessory movements, we focused on lat based, latissimus based accessory movements with the chins slash pull-ups and barbell rows and the triceps with the dips and the LTEs mm -hmm. and the rolling double extensions and now the biceps with the curls. These are all upper body accessories. So the question is, one, is there any other upper body accessories you like? There isn't for me. That's it. No, I mean, Those you might just say some dumbbell variants of these same ones. Sure. But that's really it. Sure, there's times I'll do dumbbell variants on bench press and overhead press, although I would probably consider those closer to supplemental movements than accessories, yeah. although they are, whatever. Here's the question. Why don't we do lower body accessories very often? You know, they use more muscle mass, and you can typically just do more work with the main lift. Yeah, I think so, too. I just think that if is, you... Is that right? Is that what you're yeah, I mean, I think if you really do a good hard squat and deadlift workout, 
you don't really need to do lunges and leg presses. No. And what I have found, unless you're advanced, CR yeah. I mean, at some point, show, at some show. point, you're probably going to have to put some slots in there. Probably my favorite true lower body accessory movement is a glute ham raise. That's probably my favorite lower body actual just accessory cause, movement. Just because you want those booty gains. Yeah, I just think a glute ham raise will actually only movement that takes the hamstrings from its fully lengthened state to its fully shortened state. So because it goes yeah, at the true. bottom, you're in knee extension and hip flexion. Yeah. So your hamstrings are fully lengthened, and at the top, you're in hip extension and knee flexion. Yeah, stiff leg deadlift so, isn't going to do that. No, so it only goes through, and at, no, because your knee doesn't bend. And a straight leg deadlift, you go through the full length, but you don't get the hamstring shortened at the top because the knee stays extended. So you actually have to go through something that goes from that hip flexion, so bent hip, straight knees, right, to bent knee, straight hips. That takes the hamstrings. But no. lifters really need nope. hamstring work. No, nope. well, they not, not through formal range of motion, but it's listen, it's accessory movement. What are you going to do, right? So it's not fine, do it. right? Well, we don't do it very often, yeah. right? I think that a leg press is okay. I think that so, lunges are okay. I think that kettlebell swings are okay. But I tend to use what I've noticed is that could potentially be used for lower body accessory movements. I tend to use them for conditioning work more than anything. So yeah. if I do a lunge, it's almost always a body weight lunge, and it's in sort of a circuit with maybe kettlebell swings and maybe a airdyne or a prowler or things like that. So things like prowler sleds, airdynes, kettlebell swings, those tend to be used more for Accessory conditioning. squat. Yeah, and they're more for, and we use them in, as a conditioning movement more yeah. so than an accessory movement. I've noticed that you normally don't do that unless it's DUP. This is either somebody that has a weight loss problem. Correct. It's or an advanced, advanced athlete that's yep. in DUP. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Yeah. So true. for 95% of the people that are listening to this, they probably only need to chin and barbell row. Yeah, I think so by the time you get indicated, to, let me let me rephrase this. Yeah. Instead of making a statement, when are these indicated? When you move to four day split, at first you're not going to need them, but as you start to need to add more total volume or more slots without adding tremendous amounts of stress that are going to beat up your joints, and so upper body day is just bench and press or bench and press supplemental movement and press and bench supplemental movement. I think throwing in a lat movement, a tricep movement, and a bicep movement are fine. Mm -hmm. And I think they don't beat you up and you can add that additional volume and build up some work capacity and add some hypertrophy and all those things are good. And I think it works. Uh, I add the barbell row in the midweek session for the older guys that drop the deadlift in the midweek session. And LP. For older guys who don't power clean, we replace the power clean with the barbell row. Almost always. I love the barbell row for the practice that it gives us. Yep. So we're pretty good at doing concentric contractions in most of our muscles. Yep. And eccentric, you don't really have to think about it. You just do it. Isometric's different. The muscles in the back are some of the, are the least innervated muscles in our body. We, sure. Like your eyeballs, you've got really fine motor control of your eyes right. in your hand, and you can write your name neatly, maybe. <laughs> but the muscles in the lower back, we don't have a lot of control over no. those things. And I think that men in particular need a lot of practice sure. in consciously doing concentric contraction of the muscles of the lower back. Sure. So... With the barbell row, they get opportunities to practice that. Yep. Little boys practice the concentric contraction of the bicep. Like a five-year-old little boy can go, you know, and make right. a gun, right? Right. But they don't practice so it. can't the set his lumbar in extension. Right. So <laughs> the barbell not. row gives us practice in doing that, sure. developing that neuromuscular efficiency that we hear about. Yep. I think that's really overrated, neuromuscular efficiency. I think it's really overrated, except maybe it's not when you're talking about setting the lower back. Yeah, you but have to be able to. Somebody, that's something you actually have to practice it like a some sort of a Buddhist or something. Like, yeah. you really got it. So the barbell row makes us a little stronger, although you really can't move that much weight. You know, how much stronger is a barbell row going to make somebody? But it helps them develop that control, and it gives them some more volume without destroying them with the bench. So I, I do that one early. Or, yeah, or even extra deadlifts. I mean, I think it works pretty well. I have found that for ladies, they often need to start doing their chins. And if they can't chin, they got to do lat pull downs because that's a light chin, essentially. Although that we've got that video on Barbell Logic on how to get your first chin. You don't know that because you haven't seen it yet because it hasn't released yet. But by the time this releases, it will be out. It Internet comes Superstar out like, Nikki Sims? Yeah, but she did one on the chin up that you've seen. But yep. we actually have her next set of that, which I think comes out next Tuesday, which is on how to get your first chin up, which is specifically right. for women. So by the time this comes out, that will be out. And literally, like step by step, practical 
Yeah. Here's how you do it. Very pragmatic, A plus B equals C sort of thing. Sometimes it takes a long time. It does. For squats, you could start with leg press or... Yeah. But the chin, you have to pick your whole body. To get a chin, you have to pick your whole body weight off the ground. And for some people, that's a significant number. It takes a while. She and, talks about losing weight, but she talks about how to use bands correctly yep. and then how to use so you can, jump, like a chin-up jump and eccentric lowering. So like just doing those chin-up eccentric movements and you'll get your first chin. I sometimes will add the chin before well, long before lp is over oh me too particularly for ladies who have trouble keeping the barbell on their shins in a properly executed deadlift so if you set up a lady in particular sometimes it's young men in the deadlift and they're set up correctly like yep. a lot of times the bar comes off the shin because they're not set up right but if mechanically everything's set up correctly and they can't keep the shin on their deadlift the chin can help them do that yeah. or at least a lap pull you down know sybil you know. my 82 year old lady she does lap pull down every single workout yeah. she she trains two to three times a week so sometimes two times a week sometimes three times a week she squats every workout then she benches or presses and those alternate she always deadlifts actually you know what we actually squat first then we deadlift then we do bench or press then we do lap pull downs and then we do conditioning yep every single time yep she's 82 by the way she's not novice anymore she's not intermediate anymore Right. She pulled 150 for a set of five the other day. And nice. two days later, she pulled 135 for a set of five because she was wrecked. You bet. From that 150. And that's okay. And she was like, damn, why did I? What do you think Miss Sybil weighs? I bet she weighs around 150, 165. Yeah, no, I don't. I, I think 150 is, she's pretty short. Well, probably 150. Yeah. And she does heavy. So she's doing her lap pull downs. Let's see. I've got 25s and 10s on the bar. And it's one of those ones that it's the exact weight. So it just, it's not, yeah, uh, no you know, mechanical advantage yeah, there's no mechanical advantage. So, you know, so that's 70, 80 pounds. So she's doing so between 70 and 80 pounds for lots of reps too, right? Lots of reps. like 10s and 15s. Three sets of 12. Yeah. Three sets of 12. Yeah. So we will often have young men and ladies is where I see this crop up. Can't keep the bar on their shins. We have them chin. Men may be weak too. Yeah. Like as soon as it's obvious that their form is correct, but the bar will not stay on their shin. Right. Then the uh, got to figure out how to get then the, the chin engaged. and the lat pull is indicated at that yeah, point. I, think. I like it. Yeah, it's good. I like guess it. Chins pull ups. That's the fifth exercise. Barbell rows are the sixth exercise, and then you get down the line to the kind of the next step, which is dips, some sort of tricep extension, like Seventh, L- LT, eighth, ninth yeah, exercise, straight exercise. straight bar barbell rows, and that's basically about it. And then you know it's okay when you get more advanced and you need to start adding some conditioning to play around with some stuff for lower body stuff, like some glute ham raises or lunges or leg presses or kettlebell swings, but that's way down the line for most people. And then I think you start to have to think about things as you start getting down that line, you actually start to think about impact, like how much impact it makes. Like if it's a high impact movement, it's going to beat you up more. Right. If it's high eccentric loading, it's going to beat Man. you up more. Things like those uh, things start to remember what kettlebell we're trying to swings, you know, high make load. you sore. Super Man, your butt gets sore. And so we have to start thinking about that because remember the idea behind accessory movements is to get more volume without beating you up. Right. So we want sort of low skill, low eccentric, low impact for the most yeah. part. And if the eccentric is important, then you've got to use it with some, you've really got to sort of monitor the amount of fatigue it causes. Yeah, I think underpinning all of this is that we have always, always, even if we don't say it, we're always considering training economy. Like we have always. a certain amount of time and we budget. want to get all the good out of it we That's can. That's exactly right. So even when we can do conditioning, we want to do something that might accidentally make us stronger. Sure. So we can make an argument that a heavy, heavy, heavy sled push sure. would drive the deadlift in the press uh, squat a little bit. It certainly shouldn't hurt it. Let's talk about kettlebell swings for a minute. You okay. know, I won't do them anymore because they're too for them to work. It has to be so heavy. I don't want to be swinging that around. It is not a good <laughs> idea to be swinging a 150 pound kettlebell. That's really heavy. I don't. Well, I don't. if you're going to do three sets of five and you squat, I don't do three sets of five on kettlebell swings. If you're uh, gonna, well, even if you're going to do five sets I of do five, thirty seconds on, thirty seconds off. How, much, you, how much do you need to swing to get your good out of it? Well, I'll, I'll swing a 70 pounder for 30 seconds. You're loping. <laughs> 30 seconds is a long time to swing. You're I loping. have like 18 reps. 18 is a yeah, lot. Yeah, I don't ever do them for 30s. I'll do them for 15. Yeah. But I have to swing a weight that's heavy enough. It's like, man, this is just not a good idea. The thing's like powder coated and yeah. it's slick. And it's like, you know, I, so a I did one of the dumbest workouts I've ever done back when I was doing CrossFit is we had to do. 300 kettlebell swings for time and it was the 53 so it wasn't super heavy 53 is that what it is a one pood is, is that what it is or two pood whatever that is so in anyway, a 53 pound kettlebell swing for 300 reps for time every time you had to stop every time that thing stopped moving you had to put it on the ground and you had to do five push-ups why would so you're just like i don't want to put it, it down i'm not gonna put it down i'm not gonna put it down i'm not gonna put it down and you do like 125 and then you drop it. And then you drop it and you do five push-ups. You'd be like, my life, this is terrible. 
terrible. So do you drop it when you're in mid 124th swing and it like I, flies fact, away? In like, fact, I would say like, obviously you shouldn't, but I did. And I dropped it on my $10,000 turf and left a big gash in my turf where I dropped it. Right. There was a gash forever in my turf from that workout. I can remember, and I have to see it every day. I'd be pissed off. My man, my ass was sore from that workout. I mean, sore. This was years ago. People, That's how people get rabbit. Wasn't, yeah, that is how people get rabbit. It was stupid. I said it was stupid. It was I mean, back in the day I'm when I was outrageous. Dumb. It was dumb. Is there anything more to say? No, it's it. That's accessory movements. Most of you don't need it. You don't need it for LP. You don't need it for intermediate. I don't think you need it for heavy light medium. When you're in that ballpark, I think we're doing three days a week. Full body, you shouldn't touch this stuff until you get to four day split. When you get to four day split, you'll start to introduce some you accessory should, movements. You should always look for a reason to not do these, actually. <laughs> yeah. It's, not yeah. because you're lazy or you want you to be fat. It's just, you know, you're probably best served by doing the main movements for either heavier or more volume yeah. at that point. I'd agree. Yep. But That's at some it. point, you're going to have to add it. Yep. Thanks for listening. <laughs>